This is not the aftermath of an Avengers movie after a huge fight went down, believe it or not. But it's Australia during their 2019 to 2020 bushfire season. Billowing smoke, blazing forests and an unprecedented destruction defined the landscape of Australia for almost an entire year. In that time, over 90,000 square miles of land were incinerated, affecting 3 billion animals, burning houses by the thousands and killing 34 people. Nearly 80% of all Australians were affected by these bushfires in some way, and the total damage and economic loss caused by it exceeded over $100 billion. The crazy thing? Bushfires like this are almost certain to come in the future. Wildfires globally are expected to increase by 33% by 2050, and more intensely too. But how did Australia come to be this oversized matchbox that seems to always be on fire? Well, I'd argue that Australia didn't come to be like this, but rather always has been. See, fire has been in the DNA of Australia for centuries, almost literally. If you look at the country, their geographical position has a lot to do with it. Australia is the driest inhabited continent in the world. 70% of it is either arid or semi-arid land, receiving barely any rainfall. This is due to it being south of the tropical rain belt that Indonesia and New Guinea are in, and rather in the subtropical high pressure belt, which prevents the lifting of air required for rain. Then there's the sheer size of Australia. It's huge. I mean, it's literally both a country and a continent. At the same time though, it's pretty flat. Just look at this topographical map of Australia. But this part right here, known as the Great Dividing Range, is the obvious exception. It may not have height going for it, but it does have length, being the fifth longest mountain range in the world, stretching from the top of Victoria right up through New South Wales and into Queensland for a total of 2,200 miles. This of course means that the eastern side of this mountain range receives a lot of rainfall due to the orographic lift, which is, well, science. And if you look at a population density map of Australia, you'll see the most dense areas are here too. The point I'm trying to make though is that the coastal areas get a lot of rain, but this drains the moisture out of the air, so there isn't any left to get to the core of the continent. Meanwhile, its neighbour New Zealand is much narrower, so the clouds get a chance to rain on the whole subcontinent. So most of Australia is really dry, like I said before, and that dry air promotes a greater intensity of fire than moist air. Plants become more flammable at a low humidity because they release their moisture more easily. And then there's a lot of wind too making the land simply the perfect catalyst for a little kindling to grow into a bushfire, creating more than 60,000 of them every year. That may sound, well, terrifying, but it's actually a core part of the natural environment. See, many plants in Australia have evolved to not only resist decimation caused by natural bushfires, but to even encourage them through their own means. For example, the famous eucalyptus tree, friend to all koalas, is one of such plants. The very oil this tree secretes is highly flammable, and the fallen leaves that hit the ground are resistant to decomposition by design. These eucalyptus trees essentially are throwing down fire paper, so that when a bushfire inevitably starts, all the rival plants will be burnt up. But at the same time, these trees only release their seeds when activated by the heat of fire. So the clearing of undergrowth by fire encourages the emergence of new plants, and the ashes left by fires serve as a fertilizer for regrowth. The new vegetation provides food for animals, and newly hollowed out logs and trees provide new places for them to live. Given this, it's no wonder that the native Australians adapted to using these bushfires for their own gain. The Aboriginals created an early and highly effective form of environmental control known as fire stick farming. These people understood the importance of fire as part of the cycle of life. It was used for land management. When vegetation was dry, they burned parts of the bush, also known as the outback. This not only prevented the possibility of a dense buildup of vegetation, dead leaves and branches that could fuel larger bushfires, but drew out animals that the aboriginals hunted for food, and allowed the growth of different kinds of plants in different areas throughout the year, increasing the amount of food available. However, when British settlers came to Australia in 1788, they were not all used to this fiery form of agriculture. In fact, they were quite terrified of it. To say that the climate of Great Britain and Australia are different would be the understatement of the century. Once the settlers established their presence in Australia, they were quickly to discard the fire stick farming tactics in favour of their techniques learned from home, which we know as classic agriculture. You see, the native aboriginals were primarily nomadic hunter-gatherers, using agriculture to supplement their ways. Conversely, the settlers of Australia based their food production on agriculture, and much of it on the commercial scale they were used to back in Great Britain. Farming, specifically the meat and livestock farming that Australia became famed for, is intensive both in terms of space and resources. In order to collect these resources safely, the fire stick farming method was essentially abandoned for decades. Of course, it's much harder to force Mother Nature to change her ways, especially since bushfires have reigned supreme for millennia before the settlers even set foot on Australian land. 
But to their credit, the widespread extinguishing of flames during the 19th century allowed Australians to set an agrarian framework for food and livestock alike. Given that Australia now has a thriving agricultural industry both domestically and internationally, this was seen as a strong victory. However, the opportunity cost of centuries of fire suppression instead of management made the outback become more dense with vegetation, exactly what the aboriginals didn't want to happen. The end to the controlled burning technique, combined with the growth of cities and of course the outback, truly turned up the heat for the Australia we know today. But why is fire prevention so hard in Australia? especially nowadays. As you may have guessed, the answer is more complicated than you think. But there's really just two main things. The first and most damaging way is through nature. We've already talked about why Australia is the perfect breeding ground for fires, but how they actually start in terms of nature is usually through dry lightning, where lightning can strike with little to no rainfall following it, setting a forest ablaze. Now, if you look at this map from NASA of bushfire detections from June 2001 to May 2019, you'll see that most fires around the country are in the Northern Territory and Northern areas of Western Australia and Queensland, which luckily doesn't have too many people. But make no mistake, once started, the flames can burn on superheated winds until they reach populated areas miles away. And you know what comes next. That's how basically all of the biggest bushfires in Australian history have started, Mother Nature. It's not something you can really solve, but rather just prepare for. Yet, this just makes up about half of all bushfires, arguably. And I say arguably because there's quite a few different figures going around for what this figure actually is. But according to Geoscience Australia, a government agency that deals with geology and geography, it's about half, which we'll be going with. This of course means there's a whole 50-ish percent of bushfires that start for other reasons. And that brings me to the other main thing, humans. Whether deliberate or accidental, and those numbers too are all over the place, humans are the reason for half of Australia's bushfires. It's extremely easy to carelessly start one when you live in a country that basically breeds it. All you need is an ignition source, discarded cigarettes, vehicle exhaust systems, sparks from machinery tools like lawn mowers or welding tools, and campfires are all easy, common ways fires start daily. From here, the severity of the damage just depends on the type and quantity of fuel that is available. And by fuel, I mean everything from high temperatures and strong winds, to trees, dry grassy fields and homes. For better or for worse though, these fires normally happen in readily accessible areas and are rapidly brought under control. Those that are started deliberately aren't necessarily malicious either. They could be fires that were meant to be contained but got out of control. Then of course, we have to deal with arson, which while a small problem is still definitely one. That's the thing about why I said fire prevention is so hard. Because the two obstacles are nature, which is uncontrollable, and in fact getting worse, and humans, in which we all inevitably make careless mistakes, and there's no way that'll stop. Especially in Australia with a population of 27 million people. There's certainly no shortage of it. As said before, to an extent, bushfires are natural and necessary for vegetation and forest management. However, as they become more frequent and severe, they serve mostly to destroy rather than conserve. The reason for this is because of one major thing, climate change. While fires aren't directly started by climate change, they are made much more common and dangerous by it. The higher the temperature, the more likely it is that a fire will start or continue to burn, due to the fuel being closer to its ignition point. Meanwhile, the continent is still gradually drying more and more with less and less rain. Australia's climate has warmed by more than one degree Celsius over the past century, and this change has caused an increase in the frequency and intensity of heat waves, as you can undeniably see here. For example, in 2019, there were four times more fire alerts in New South Wales than at any other point in the past 20 years. And if you look at this graph, eight of Australia's top 10 warmest years on record have occurred since 2005. 2019 was also Australia's driest ever year since 1900, with rainfall 40% lower than average. So what does all this mean? Well, let's first look at a few historical bushfire seasons, starting with the 1974-1975 one. By the time the fires were done burning, approximately 290 million acres were burnt to ashes. And yes, you heard me correctly. To put that into perspective, that's 15% of Australia's landmass that suffered extensive fire. It was the biggest bushfire event by area ever recorded. Even though the damage done by those fires was recorded to be low, because if you take a look at the affected areas of the fire, much of it was situated in areas that are nowhere near as populous as the coastal cities. Then there was the Black Saturday bushfires of 2009, the most deadly bushfire in Australian history. 173 people left dead, thousands made homeless, and 1.1 million acres burned. Its infamous name came from the day of its peak, Saturday, January the 7th, 2009 with about 400 individual fires that day scorching the country. 
many cities, including Melbourne, recorded their highest temperatures since records began in 1859, along with there being 60 mile per hour winds, and it was described as the worst day of fire conditions in the history of the state. Then of course, I already talked about the 2019-2020 bushfire season in the beginning, which basically had fire exploding from thin air. I'll just let these photos do further explaining. Anyways, so what am I getting at here? Well, what this all means is that we can expect bushfires like this to become much more common in the future. And that's terrible for the obvious reasons, but looking at it through a different lens as well, for example on an economic scale, while the damages from wildfires are a big hit, they're still recoverable. But trying to recover from that more often will put a major blow in both Australia's food security and economy. This isn't to mention either that the forests may regrow after being burnt, but they won't store the same amount of carbon because recovery is never 100%, and to make up for that will cost billions as well. So now that begs the question, how is Australia handling being extremely fire prone? Well, back when the land was only inhabited by wandering tribes and people in smaller groups, bushfires weren't a problem to the way of life. Even during bushfire season, which is during their summer from December to February, when conditions are easiest to start a fire, it was an easy thing to adapt to and actually good. But metropolitan cities, suburbs and commercial farms are highly threatened by the widespread damage caused by bushfires, not to mention the unbreathable smoke created by them. So modern times call for different measures. While Australians can't directly stop the fires caused by nature, they indirectly can at least help them, sort of. Australia is currently the fifth largest producer, second largest exporter, and has the third largest reserves of coal in the world. This obviously doesn't bode well for the climate. Coal is a major source of carbon dioxide emissions, a leading greenhouse gas. When Australia burns coal for energy, it contributes to global warming. Higher global temperatures can exacerbate bushfires by creating drier, hotter conditions that are more prone to igniting and sustaining fires. It's a vicious cycle, all in the name of money, that shows no real signs of slowing down, and is in fact getting worse according to the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis. Diversifying away from coal is no doubt one of the best starts for stopping itself from always being on fire. Of course this is done by corporations rather than individuals, but everybody can voice their desire for an improved climate and ecosystem. In terms of stopping man-made fires, numerous policies have been implemented and are being implemented to stop them. For example, on days when conditions are basically perfect for a fire to combust, there's total fire bans. It makes it illegal to light an open-air fire or conduct any activity that could start a fire. And these aren't just obvious things, but stuff like sprinklers, electric fences, and some barbecues are all prohibited. And remember the fire stick farming done by the Aboriginals? Well, it's making a comeback. Founded in 2016, the Jagun Alliance is an Aboriginal-owned non-profit that teaches their fire management ways to landowners. And because the technique is as effective as it was even a few centuries ago, it's being used a lot more. Then there's the way of helping via culture changes. Currently, Year 5 geography in the Australian education system includes the impact of bushfires or floods on environments and communities, and how people can respond. But many even propose adding bushfire safety to the school curriculum as early as second and third grade, just cementing it in its culture. Past that, maintaining a wide vegetation-free zone around properties, using fire-resistant building materials by ensuring that there is always good access for firefighting vehicles, and keeping gutters and decking free of burnable debris are things being systematically done nationwide to minimize any damage that may come from bushfires. Meanwhile, technologically, more sophisticated computer models are able to predict how a blaze will develop, allowing better planning of firefighting resources. And on a more personal level, every household more or less has, or at least should have, a detailed plan for bushfires. Every summer during bushfire season, it's drummed into citizens that they should not expect firefighters to be able to save them. Even one of the alerts literally says, you are in danger and need to act immediately to survive. It is too late to leave. This knowledge can literally be the difference between life or death. These are all just some of the many things Australia is doing though. Whether it'll be enough remains to be seen, especially because the most dangerous bushfires by acreage are from nature, and trying to take care of that really just comes down to the government. Though it looks like the heat is only going to increase, it seems that the conviction and force of will among Australians will grow with it as well. So who knows what's in store? Thank you for watching.